Act 4, Scene 2. Uh, now, the purpose of this scene, as I briefly touched on last time, is to provide a contrast with the previous scene. Uh, we've just, the, the previous scene was, uh, it filled us with moral and physical disgust. Uh, the physical disgust, you know, the witches were physically disgusting and they were throwing eye of bat and newt into a stew which they, in some versions, they forced Macbeth to actually drink. Um, that uh, That's juxtaposed, that moral and physical disgust. The moral disgust, of course, is Macbeth's ruthlessness and his willingness to, well, he announces, I'm going to kill everybody. You know, it, it, that there's a moral disgust there for sure. So it, that is juxtaposed with the next scene, which is a very tender scene. Uh, the, the camera shifts, the, the scene shifts, and we are now... Um, in, in a domestic environment with the uh, with with the innocents, uh, Lady Macduff and her child, um, who have who have nothing to do with all this stuff. Macduff, of course, is tied up in the politics, but these people are just getting caught in the crossfire. Crossfire. Um, so the scene opens. There's not a lot to to talk about in this um, in this scene. It, it, it's 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 just it just has an emotional impact. Like I say, that juxtaposition, it it, it con the contrast of it just it it shows you how vile Macbeth is, and it makes it very hard for me to argue that he's a moral guy. So fair enough, ladies and gentlemen, you guys win. He's 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 a vile vile creature, or has become a vile creature. And yet, I'm at the end. I'm still going to argue for sympathy. Now, I want to talk about. Uh, I love talking about the contrast, and I use this. I use Van Gogh uh, as an example for that. Um, when you think about literature, uh, it's kind of useful to to look at the parts. I mean, I, so far we've just been digging in here, looking at that, digging in here, and looking at that. But we haven't been stepping back and saying, well, here's section A, and here's a section B. Why did Shakespeare follow section A with section B? There, there's a reason for that as well. When, when an artist is composing the, the chunks of stuff, they choose carefully. They don't randomly say, well, let's just put this wherever. They come after each other for a reason. Um, and so my question is why, again, does this scene follow the previous one? And I just kind of answered the question. But just to demonstrate how this works uh, visually, we can, we can look at this. Um, everybody knows Van Gogh, of course, and we all love him. If you don't, what's wrong with you? Uh, it's just gorgeous. Um, I read somewhere. I'm not a I'm not an art historian or anything, but I, I read uh, I read bits and I've seen some Van Gogh. Uh, and yellow for him uh, was 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 uh, was a color of optimism and 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 joy and appreciation of of life itself and the, the positive aspect of being alive, despite the fact that we all know. Van Gogh had some serious mental illness. Uh, he he did he ended up killing himself, and yeah, it was a pretty it was a pretty grim affair. He suffered from depression, but he was still able to see. He probably had some some psych, psychotic problems or whatever. I don't know, but anyway, he he was he was in his paintings. He left the great gift to us of uh, an ability to see uh, the 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 joy in life. This this one is the, one of the most famous ones. In it, we see the, uh, there's, there's a relevatory experience of the positive aspect of the universe. It's, there's, there's a glory here in merely being alive and being able to witness this. Um, he might have been having a schizophrenic crack up when he painted it, but it's still, it's, it's you know, it, what else are you going to do in life? Just look at a black, empty space? We can talk about that when we talk about Macbeth's nihilism and existential crisis. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. He achieves this. Like I said, yellow for him was this with this color of positivity. But, but, but I'm going to show you in a second. It is positive and life affirming when it's contrasted with the blue and the whites and the and the gentle greens, the the natural color greens. Um, it just it's stunning. That it just the combination of those colors just 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 amazes us. Even in this crappy little painting, this is like a two a rundown two star old shack. I mean, it, it's 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 a grubby little place. It, it's an it's evidence of low existence in terms of the economic hierarchy, and yet the yellow and the blue, the the light pouring in from outside suffuses the room with uh, with. An appreciation of, of life as life itself. Um, that that's my interpretation. But look what happens when you juxtapose his favorite color, yellow. Here's the same yellow. I think it's the same yellow. It's probably slightly different, but it's 
basically, as far as my eye can tell, it's the same yellow, but he juxtaposes it with something with a very different color. He juxtaposes it with the red. And instead of that life-affirming, relevatory uh, appreciation of the potential of life, we see the exact opposite. This is that. This is the depressed life. This is where um, uh, hope has been lost. Sorry, my stupid series going off. Um, yeah, this is where we see uh, a loss of hope, uh, and it's partly due to the contrast of the yellow, that same yellow, with a, a dingier, slimier green as opposed to the vibrant natural green, and of course the red. It makes it lurid. And, uh, and 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 gross, and and unappealing and cold. Now, of course, art being art, you have to you, you take that little element, uh, and then you you make an argument with that, and it makes sense. We just made that argument, but then you you couple it with another argument, and then you can really nail home the theme or the thesis of the painting. And the thesis of the painting here is that uh, you know bars later at night can be a pretty lonely existentialistly grim place uh, and the other components that he adds to it to complete that thesis is hands in the pockets he's not celebrating anything he's not holding anyone's hand pool cue on the table not being used in a in an engagement with life there's zero engagement in life here these guys are not engaged with each other the woman is not looking at the man he looks like he's maybe harassing her and she's powerless to do anything about it this guy's grim the two chairs here are empty one of them is facing this way so it's closed it's not even facing the action where it would participate in whatever they're doing anyway I'm, I'm getting a little bit off track here but my point is is that when you're doing your analysis pull back a little bit and look at the different scenes why does he have that scene contrasted with that scene and how do they help each other and so what I'm saying is that the, the dark grim disgusting uh, aspect of this scene um, uh, makes us feel as an audience member we come off of this and then we come into this and it makes us hate Macbeth uh, so much so much the more when we see this this very sad scene anyway okay so uh, it, I, like I said there's not a lot to say about this except for what I've already said and some of some thematic elements so I'm just going to go through to make sure you know what's happening because there are some plot elements here okay so Lady Macduff uh, what had he done to make him fly the land? So she's complaining. Why did my husband leave? He went down to England. Why did he leave? And Ross is trying to defend him and say, you have to have patience. You don't know the whole story, which is true. Uh, he had none. He had no patience, my husband. His flight was crazy. He, he ran away. When our actions do not, our fears make us traitors. So she says that even if he, if even if his actions politically weren't uh, traitorous, then, then his fear made him run away. Um, from us and become traitors. So she, I think she means that he's a traitor in a double sense. He ran away from Scotland and he ran away from them, probably more importantly, because she's got a child to look after uh, in dangerous times. So again, he's defending his, his, uh, his comrade. Uh, you know not whether it was his wisdom or his fear. So he knows something of the politics behind it. She doesn't. Uh, to be fair, um, Shakespeare... Um, get some flack for painting weak characters. Uh, when we do Hamlet, uh, you'll see some weak female characters. Uh, the females in that play are just abysmal. Um, I'm going to defend Hamlet or, or Shakespeare uh, to the death because he's got amazing women in so many other plays. In this play, we've got an amazing woman. Lady Macbeth is right on. She's so real. Lady Macduff, not so real, perhaps. Um, as you'll see, she's a little bit weak. Ophelia in Hamlet is really weak. Juliet in Romeo and Juliet is is a real woman, a girl, not a woman, a girl. She's a real girl, uh, fully fleshed out and uh, and and believable. So he's yeah, Shakespeare. He knows what he's doing. He can he can paint a real character no matter who it is, uh, and sometimes he doesn't really care too much. And in this scene, Lady Macbeth is not a major character. She's very one dimensional. Uh, well, maybe not. We'll just have a look. Okay, so um, he says he, he he probably ran away. You don't know. You don't know the whole story. It might have been wise for him to run away, not necessarily his fear. Wisdom to leave his wife and his babies and his babes, his mansion and his titles in a place from thence himself to fly, to leave all of that stuff in a place where he doesn't want to be himself? Good point. Good point. I can't argue against that. It was. Macduff. 
here's the big conflict here. Uh, where does he, where do his duties lie? It's actually one of the grand themes. Um, I've got it in my notes. Uh, one of the grand themes of, of all literature is uh, self versus society. Where do your duties lie? Do your duties lie to yourself, your individual personal needs, or do your duties lie to the state, to the society? How much do you sacrifice for one or the other? Now, we happen to live very, very fortunately in the year 2020, in a society where we don't have to, we're not called upon to sacrifice ourselves for society. We can indulge in all of our self-fulfilling hero quests that we care to indulge in. So thanks for that, society. Someone like Macduff, or go back a couple of decades for crying out loud, and you'll find societies, you'll find a society where we were, that's it, forget it. I saw the movie 1917 recently. Sacrifice. There was no question. You just sacrifice yourself for the greater good. Here, here, Ross is trying to imbue her with a sense of that perhaps there's a greater good that must be attended to before the personal good. She's a she's a, a woman in this age, and she has these concerns. And I, you can't fault her for this because good grief, she's got to take care of her her her, her son. So here, uh, duty to state, the greater good, versus duty to family, duty to self, duty to personal um, um, uh, loves. Macduff chooses the state. He sacrifices his own happiness and the lives of his family. Uh, he's a character foil. We couldn't think of him as, in this sense, it's a little bit of a weak connection, but not necessarily. Uh, Macbeth chooses personal ambition. See, Macbeth sacrifices nothing but his, well, his soul, I suppose. We could think of it in that way. But anyway, we, you know what I mean. He's Macbeth wants it for him, 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 his ego. He, he, he. You know, the society be damned. We just saw it in the last scene. You know, society be damned. Okay. Uh, he loves us not. So she's bitter. She's very, very bitter that that her husband left her. He wants the natural touch. Now, this is one of those famous uh, uh, false friends. This doesn't mean to want something. This means to lack something. So he lacks the natural touch. So he's unnatural. Nature versus unnatural theme. And then she compares him to a bird. She says, the poor bird, the wren, the most, the smallest of birds, the most diminutive of birds, will fight if her young ones are in the nest against an owl. So the owls are big predatory birds, right? And the little bird will fight against the owl to protect the babies. So yeah, fair enough. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good criticism. All is the fear, nothing is the love. He doesn't love us. He's just a chicken and he ran away. As little as the wisdom where the flight so runs against all reason. So it was not reasonable at all for him to run away. It must have been just uh, fear. Um, themes, nature versus unnatural. Shakespeare leaves the Macduff question open. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and I've mentioned many times before that Shakespeare leaves a lot of questions open. Um, so go ahead. He, he wasn't thinking of students' essays when he was writing these things. He was thinking about trying to capture the human experience as accurately as possible. And the human experience, as you even probably know in your young age, is, is, is pretty damn messy. Um, my dearest cuz, I pray you school yourself. So now he gets really angry. He says, no, you don't know. He's, he's a good man. He's defending duck. But, but for your husband, he is noble, wise, judicious, and best knows the fits of the season. True, true, and true. I dare not speak much further. But cruel are the times when we are traitors and do not know ourselves. So here we go back to the inauthentic lives, uh, the, the, the wasteland paranoia, the great chain of being is disrupted and everyone's living inauthentic lives. There's denunciation among, you know, among all of your friends. You could be denounced at any moment. So he dares not speak any further. He can't explain to her the reasons uh, because he doesn't know who's listening. The servant, her servant, is most likely paid because Macbeth already said, you know, I have a servant in every household paid. But crueler times when we are traders and we do not know ourselves. So he doesn't even, you don't, you don't, you don't even know if, you, if you're, if who you should be. You're trying to follow the good man, but it turns out that following the good man means that you're a traitor to these other guys. So it's, it's this, this, uh, this topsy turvy world. When we hold rumor from from what we fear, yet know not what we fear. So you're listening to things and you don't even know what you're supposed to be afraid of. But we float upon a wild and violent sea each way and move. So yeah, he's just, they're just bobbing with the times, trying to stay alive. Uh, I take my leave of you. So he's going to leave. Uh, shall not be long, but I'll be here again. So he's going to, he's got to take off for a little while and he's got to, and then he's, he'll be back. Things at the worst will cease or else climb upward to what they were before. So things are going to end one way or the other. 
we'll find out my pretty cousin blessing upon you now this is really convenient Shakespeare does this again in Romeo and Juliet if you've done that play uh, which you might have um, at the very very end Friar Lawrence chickens out and he runs away and uh, and that's that's I think it kind of goes against the nature of Friar Lawrence or it it reflects badly on Friar Lawrence he's a coward and he runs away at the last minute and he leaves the two lovers alone so that gives them opportunity to kill themselves so if he hadn't run away then uh, they wouldn't have killed themselves but Shakespeare needed to have him run away so Shakespeare might have been right in this play and he said oh I really like Friar Lawrence I wanted him to be a heroic kind of guy doing doing his best he can but I have to get rid of him. I have to get rid of him because Romeo, because Juliet has to be able to kill herself or Romeo has to be able to kill himself. And we can't have Friar Lawrence hanging around because he'd stop the death. So anyway, there's some mechanics. There's some sausage making at play here where uh, Shakespeare has to get Ross out of the picture so that it leaves uh, the, the, the family vulnerable. That, that, that's kind of neat. There's your, I don't know. It's, it, it's it's the art. It's the it's the not the art. It's the craft. It's the it's the the mechanics of, of playwriting. Uh, okay. So and now she's still very very bitter. Fathered he is, and yet he's fatherless. My my son, he has a father, but he's fatherless. Appearance versus reality. Everything's upside down. Um, now he just says, "I have to get out of here. It would be your disgrace." This is kind of cute. Uh, I I'm, I'm I'd be a fool if I stayed longer. It would be my disgrace and your discomfort if I stayed. So maybe there's like you know the impropriety of a man visiting a noble man visiting a noble another noble's wife. So he's got to get out of there. Um. So he leaves. Now they're all alone. Sarah, that was just a kind of a hey you or dude. It was like dude of uh, when you talk down to someone not of the same level or higher than you. Sarah, your father's dead, and what will you do now? How will you live? Now, this this is actually, again, I, this I, it's not, it maybe it's not very believable, and if you don't like Lady Macduff in this scene, then fair enough. Um, would you ask what what a real mother, or, or not a real mother, a strong mother would do, a, a collected mother, a mother who has presence of mind, the instinct would be to keep calm so that you're not, transferring your fears onto your child that's the smart thing to do so either Shakespeare is not considering her very much and not writing her very deeply like he doesn't write the women in Hamlet he doesn't think very deeply about how they would respond to real life situations and fair enough they're just they're not the central characters of the play so we can kind of brush them off in other plays you know, uh, Shakespeare does think carefully about the women, so he's he, he can't be accused of misogyny. Um, but look at this. This is kind of weird. Your father's dead, and how are you going to do? How are you going to live? So she's she's working him up. It's almost like she's trying to get him to panic. Um, but again, there's a bit of sausage making here because he he has to have her say these weird things because he wants to have the the witty son responding. We'll live as mothers, as birds do, mother. What with worms and flies? With what I get, I mean, so and so do they. So he's they start this little banter that's actually quite amusing. But again, there's this undertone of darkness throughout the whole thing. You'll see, poor bird, thou'dst never fear the net nor lime, the pitfall nor the gin. So she's saying that you're so naive that you're not going to look out for life's traps. You're too naive that you'll just go through life and eat the, what nature provides for you. See the note of cynicism? She's incredibly cynical, and that's what we've said before, that that's where, here, well, here it is here. Cynicism infects all levels of a corrupt society. Cynicism. Listen to yourself. Listen to your friends. How cynical are you? Are you always determined to see the worst in every situation? Think about it. The internet makes us really cynical because you can't say, oh, I love this without somebody coming up and trolling you and saying, no, you're an idiot for loving it. It's like, oh, okay, fine. I won't love anything. I'll protect myself, and I'll say everything sucks. Then I'll be strong and powerful and everyone will respect me. That's a cynical society. So keep an eye on that. That's dangerous. That's that's what partly what Shakespeare's warning against here. Um, so she says, you're naive. And he says, why should I, mother? Why should I fear the traps of life? Poor birds, uh, they are not set for. My father is not. Yeah, so he says, uh, he says hunters, these hunters that, that set traps don't try to chat trap pitiful little crappy birds with no meat on them so I should be so I should be fine that's a clever response kicks back at his mother my father is not dead for all you're saying and he says yes he is dead and how will you do how wilt thou do for a father he throws back at her nay how will you do for a husband what are you going to do for a husband that's kind of funny 
and cynical reply, I can buy me 20 at any market. Ooh, that's pretty, pretty nasty. Then you'll buy, well, this goes back to maybe what Macbeth said earlier about the, the catalog of men. Yes, in the catalog you go for man, but what kind of man? Just like all the dogs are all in the catalog. They're all called dogs, but there's different degrees of dogs. So maybe that lesson could come in handy here. She doesn't see the difference. Yeah, okay, you can buy 20 in any market, but, but what? 10% of them are going to be losers like Macbeth. Choose a good man or a good man. Uh, so then you'll buy him to sell him again. Again, he's playing this game. It's a game of tennis. It's very witty. The audience is supposed to be charmed by it. Thou speakest with all thy wit, and yet in faith thy wit enough for thee. So it's still a childish wit, the meaning that he's still a child. So it's your type of wit. It's still childish wit. Still call, calling him naive because he doesn't understand the ways of the world. Because she's bitter. She's a bitter, embittered older woman who, who, who's, who's, who's suffered in life and, and now, like the witches, give me some chestnuts, please. You know, you get, you, you get hit enough in life and you become bitter and sour. The Joker. It's the Joker theme. You get, you get crapped on enough in life and you see the world as nothing but crap. That's exactly what's happening to her here. So sad. Uh, okay, so, and then the boy asks a good question. Was my father a traitor? Aye, he was. What is a traitor? So he wants a definition. He's still a kid. One that swears, one that promises something and lies. Uh, well, equivocators. Uh, and be all traitors that do so. Are all traitors, are all people who promise and lie, are they all traitors? And she says, everyone that does so is a traitor and must be hanged. Wow, that's pretty vicious. So here's the big question, I suppose. Uh, Macduff, we have talked about this already. Uh, Duff, the traitor to the family. He's faithful servant of the state, however. So there's an ability of equivocation there. Appearance versus reality. He appears to be, in one realm, he appears to be a, a traitor. He actually is. But in another realm, he's actually quite faithful to the state. So he's a good man. Uh, and the son, so she says, everyone who's a traitor must be hanged. And he says, and, and must they all be hanged that lie and swear? Every one of them? Who must hang them? Good question. Why the honest men? Well, I thought she didn't believe in any honest men. Well, he comes up. He? This is this is even more, you know, I said it here. This is even more poignant coming from a child. This cynicism from a child is even more grotesque and more disturbing than it coming from a, an experienced woman. Then the liars and swearers, the liars and promisers are fools. For there are liars and promisers are enough to beat the honest men and hang them up. So here's a cynical comment for you. There are more liars in the world than there are honest men, so why don't the liars just beat up the honest men? And she laughs and she says, God help me, poor monkey, what will you do for a father? If he were dead, would you weep for him? If you would not, it were a good sign that I should quickly have a new father. <laughs> yep, if you're not going to weep for my old dad, then this problem, maybe there's a sign that you already have a husband lined up for the next one clever boy cynical boy it's a funny laugh the audience would be chuckling right now this was the funniest joke perhaps of the whole scene so far um poor prattler how thou talkst she laughs at him too uh but the the humor again there's those contrasts those contrasting colors the contrasting images uh boom right after that joke shakespeare has his laughing and then he takes us right down and he shocks us. A messenger bursts in and says, Bless you, fair dam. I am not to you known, so you don't know me. Um, and in your state, I am perfect. I think it, he's saying that I'm, I'm, I, I know that you're an honor, uh, that you're a noble woman, and I've come to give you some bad news. I doubt some danger. I suspect some danger does approach you nearly. I've heard rumors of something bad happening. If you will take a, a, a single man's advice, don't be found here. Be not found here. Hence, go away. Go hence with your little ones. To fright you thus, methinks I am too savage. I am sorry for being so savagely brutal to you right now. But to do worse, uh, to do worse to you were fell cruelty, uh, which is too nigh your person. Heaven preserve you. I dare abide no longer. So again, he does the Friar Lawrence thing, and he takes off. He doesn't say to defend them. He runs away. Or he doesn't help them run away. He runs away himself, and so that they're alone. So there's more stagecraft there. These these two people end up alone, which might be on, back in those days, was it 
you know, we remember back in those days, they, everyone carried a sword with them because it was it was part of 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 your upbringing would be to prepare yourself to defend the weak. That was part of the code. And Ross doesn't do it, and this messenger doesn't do it. So, but Shakespeare has to get them out of the way, so he makes them kind of unnatural, perhaps. Uh, so yes, I, I to do anything less than than to do anything less than scare you right now would be savagely cruel because I, I fear you're going to be killed. So I have to tell you. So sorry for scaring you. Uh, and Lady Macbeth says he exits, and Lady Macbeth says to herself, really, she probably turns to the audience and she says, uh, "Where should I go? Whither should I fly? I have done no harm." Then she turns, actually, in the in the seventy nine version, she then this is when she turns to the audience. She turns to the camera, actually, and she says, "But I remember now. I am in this earthly world where to do harm is often a good idea. It's often uh, laudable. It's often praiseworthy. To do good is sometimes accounted dangerous folly. Why then, alas, do I put up that womanly defense to say that I've done no harm? So there's the wasteland, the cynicism. In a wasteland, it's it's commendable to do harm." Uh, and it's foolish to try to do good because you're going to get beaten down. There's a great Japanese uh, uh, expression. It's called the, uh, the the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. So anybody who, and if everybody's down, it's a wasteland, and everybody's living an inauthentic life, and everybody's got their heads down, and you're the one who sticks up and say, hey, there's something wrong here. Maybe we should do, be doing things this way. You're going to get hammered down. And you know that. You know that from your Internet experience. Your Twitter experience. Twitter is a place of nailed down nails, and the one that sticks up gets nailed. In Canada, we have an expression called uh, uh, "we cut tall poppies." So there's a poppy field. Poppies are flowers, and we like to have them all the same level. And if one gets too tall, it sticks out. We chop them. So it's the same thing. Um, so in this wasteland, don't be the tall poppy. Don't be the nail that ticks out. In this wasteland, you be wasted like everybody else. That's what she's saying. Sad. Wasteland. Where's the hero? The hero's the one that sticks up. And we hate him. Because all of us have our heads down and we're not doing anything to change anything. And the hero comes up. And the hero is the one that says, you're doing things wrong. And we don't like to be told we're doing things wrong. So we reject the hero. There's a great scene in one of the Spider-Man movies, I think, with Tobey Maguire, one of those earlier ones, kind of early. There's so many of them. But I remember the scene on the bus. There's this lovely scene on the bus uh, where the, or, or the train, where the train is falling off, the, the elevated train is falling off the rails, and Spider-Man comes in, and he's saving everybody. And there's this glorious scene where the camera shifts and everything slows down, and they show all the, the standers by, like the bystanders, the, the, the common people, they look to the hero, and the hero is kind of just stunned by it. He says, oh, oh, yeah, wow, yeah, this is my job, isn't it? Uh, it's a lovely, it's one of my favorite scenes in all of those uh, those superhero movies uh, where it, it the hero is given his due or her due. They're, 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 it's acknowledged that somebody has to stand up. It's acknowledged that somebody has to be the tall poppy, that somebody has to be the nail that sticks out. Otherwise, nothing gets changed. The wasteland doesn't get healed. Uh, it's lovely. So that's what we have hero stories for. Um, we'll keep telling them again and again and again. So come on, Malcolm. Come on, Malcolm. So then the murderer enters, and she says, who are these faces? What are these faces? And he says, where's your husband? I hope in a place, I hope in no place so unsanctified where such as thou mayst find him. Lovely line. So we criticized Shakespeare's writing of Lady Macduff as kind of unrealistic, but here she is. She looks death in the face, and she spits in that face. Really nice line. Uh, tough woman. He's a traitor. And the son speaks up. Brave little boy, too. Two heroes, two poppies. They stuck their heads up. Thou liest, thou shag-haired villain. And then the murderer insults him, what you egg, and stabs him young fry of treachery. He has killed me, mother. Run away, I pray you. So Lady Macbeth tries to run away, but the murderers follow her and he dies. Uh, depending on the version that you, the movie that you watch, this will be staged probably differently. They probably won't. In a movie, they wouldn't have her run. I've never seen her run off the stage. They would murder her right on, on camera. Very sad scene. Uh, very full of pathos. Um, and, and like I mentioned before, 
that contrast with the moral disgust that we felt uh, now we feel that in this scene with the witches and the grossness and the moral uh, fetid swamp that they're living in up there and this is the results of, of, of the, the product uh, of the wasteland is this this pathos uh, and then Again, I'm trying to draw your attention to the perp, the, the function of contrast. Uh, there's there's a there's a beautiful contrast here. Let us speak out some desolate shade. Let us seek out some desolate shade, and there weep our sad bosoms empty. The hero, Toby Maguire, comes on. Toby Maguire would be good for this actually, because Malcolm is young, um, and and somewhat naive looking, but. But with with the soul that is that is ready to take that is ready to take on the challenges of the dark forest to become that hero, um, I liked him in Spider Man. Uh, this is it. So Malcolm actually speaks what we are feeling, um, and it 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 the next scene. And I'm going to stop here for a break. But the next scene is going to talk about, it's, it's going to be about Malcolm and Macduff talking about the virtues of a good king, the kingly virtues. And it, it, it's, I, I think I mentioned earlier on in the play that it's a weird scene. And it's kind of, if you just read it by itself, it's like, oh, this is so boring. This is, this is dull. There's no action. They're just talking about all this philosophical stuff. But after that, after seeing the grotesque moral corruption the results in the real world of that moral corruption in this murder of innocence, then Shakespeare makes his comment on the importance and the value of us to, 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 to be actively aware of what it means to be a good leader. And we can apply this lesson to our modern day politics um, very, very easily on one side of the political spectrum or or whatever, or or wherever. It's a it's 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 a global, universal, eternal question. What makes a good leader? A good leader is the one that keeps this stuff from happening. Anyway, okay. So we'll do scene three later. <laughs>